Hey guys, thank you so much for joining our very first well-attended online workshop. I'm the founder, William Rader, and well-attended is easy to use box office management system that's used by theaters, uh, by artists like musicians, magicians, uh, burlesque performers. And today we're here with Mitch Stark, who is the founder of Theater Avenue. He was back on the show, last on the show, uh, on episode three of the Well Attended podcast. So if you want to learn more about projection backdrops, you can go back and listen to episode three. So Mitch, thank you so much for joining us today. Before we start out this workshop, what have you been up to for the past year and a half? Wow, a lot. I mean, we are always um, experimenting and looking for new ways to um, do cool things with projections. Um, we've been working on uh, a lot more ballet shows. I just worked with a, um, a local group here in Atlanta. We're centered here in Atlanta and uh, was working with them on their modern ballet show. We were doing some uh, abstract projections with a lot of uh, color and mood and different kinds of scenery. Um, so we're working with them. We've, we worked on a production of Swan Lake that uh, actually was in China and uh, we did some pretty traditional drops, but the cool thing is we were working with um, lots of different kind of abstract lighting scenarios, trying to give them lots of options because those of you who've worked with projections before, you know that one of the limitations of course is that you can't shine light on them like you can a traditional backdrop. So we were finding different ways to manipulate the digital imagery so that you could transition between them and get different kinds of cool lighting effects. Um, and that was neat too, because uh, you know they were used, the, the images we created were used for projection, but then they also had some LED screens uh, in some of the theaters where they uh, displayed some of the images there, which from what we heard, they, they looked really beautiful. So uh, we've been working on a lot of different shows. In fact, Theater Avenue, um, you know, how we kind of got started was I was working with one community theater group and uh, just doing projections for all of their shows is kind of how I got into it. And then we realized, gosh, if we're creating all of this artwork, all this content for these shows, we could just make it more available to high schools, to middle schools, to community theater groups, even to semi-professional and professional groups. So we opened up uh, Theater Avenue and it's, it's an online store of all of our uh, projection artwork. So at a, uh, you know, as we kind of go along, uh, we'll develop an entire show. We'll do a James and the Giant Peach. We'll do a ballet show. We'll do these different things. And then we add these collections to the site and, and make that uh, content available to whoever wants to hop online and, and purchase it. So and am yeah. I right that you do all of the art for all of the projections? I do. Yeah. So we we start with old school materials. We start with pencils and pens and paper and we design uh, by hand and then we scan those drawings into the computer and I uh, paint them in Photoshop. And uh, I take a lot of photographs too to do different photographic textures. And then we carry those through into animation and, um, and produce the final um, basically movie files or QuickTime files that we then use for, for the shows. So I'm curious, how many projections do you now have in your shop? Well, we just, we just crossed the 100 landmark. So we're over 100 now. Wow. And like I tell people at trade shows, we're going to keep designing shows until there's no more shows to design, which is forever. And uh, we're doing a lot more custom work too. So a lot of times directors will come to us and they have a project in mind that they're interested in. I saw one of our um, members today is a magician. So, you know, if you have a particular show or theme in mind, we'll work individually with people to kind of create their artistic vision as well as just doing our own projects to add to the store too. So I'd love to kind of get into the presentation and we're gonna start here with just showing some examples of projection backdrops that other theater companies have used. So why don't we go right into this, Mitch? Yeah, these images are actually, you know, from Broadway. This is an image from um, a recent addition to the Broadway stage, which is Anastasia. And I think one of the reasons why I wanted to show this image um, was mostly just to make the point that projection design has really always been a um, supplement or sort of a side piece to scenic design, but more and more it's becoming part of the very fabric of, of scenic design. It's being used as more of a centerpiece. Um, there's lots of cool things and effects being done um, on Broadway, but then off Broadway and lots of other places internationally too. 
And, um, you know, I mean, just to give you an example, I'm working with a, uh, with a group now, we're doing a version of Christmas Carol, and we're talking about doing some things, uh, adding some old school effects and actually projecting onto things like moving fog or, or incorporating sort of old Hollywood effects, but then bringing uh, projection into that space too. Um, if you wanna to advance to the next one, William, we have, um, this is from Newsies. And uh, if you've seen, either seen Newsies or you've, I think it's actually available on Netflix if you wanna watch it. But um, what I love about this is that, you know, it kind of demonstrates that it's not just straight one image behind the actor's kind of scenic design that's being used or scenic projections that are being used. A lot of times they'll build specific screens or specific platforms. In this case, a lot of the pieces, the screens will move. Um, and then they also introduce text or other um, graphic images, you know, besides just scenery. And so there's a lot of it really cool inventive things that are happening. And that's what I love about it personally is that it's not just, um, you know, kind of a gimmick. It's, it's being uh, designed in a very specific way to incorporate it into, into the overall scenic design of the show. Um, I think the last one here, yeah, I just wanted to show, this is from Finding Neverland. I just wanted to show a few examples from, you know, what's being done uh, professionally. I think there was a New York Times article that came out a few weeks ago that was just talking, kind of making that very point. Once again, that, you know, this has always been kind of an add-on, but now, now that technology is becoming more and more widely used, and you're especially seeing it more in the high school scene and the college scene, um, smaller venues and smaller shows because anybody can kind of get their hands on a laptop. Projectors are getting more powerful, they're getting brighter. And so a lot of this technology, which wasn't as available before, I think it's kind of like the old Hollywood system. There were, you know, these big expensive film cameras. You kind of had to work your way through the studio system to be able to make a film. And then when digital came in, it just democratized all of that. And the same thing is happening in theater. Now that technology is advancing to a point where everybody has their hands on it, you know, it's, it's, there's a lot of interest in it. People are using it a lot more. So I'd love to talk about just for a moment why you would want to use projection backdrops over more traditional backdrops. Yeah, and I, I mean, I put it at the at the top here. Uh, there's a director that I work with, and she loves to use the phrase "point and shoot," which of course comes from photography. And for her, she describes it as "point and shoot." It's it's, it's something that comes very intuitively that she can just do um, without putting a lot of thought into the technical piece. She you know, of course, you always have to work with certain AV or technical people to bring your show to the stage. But uh, but for her, it was literally renting a projector, using her existing psych, and, you know, she turns on the projector, puts the images onto the laptop, connects it all together, and it just works. And for her, it was either going to be a black curtain um, where the audience has to you know, they have to suspend that disbelief or you can start to kind of immerse them in the world of the story that you're telling by using some of this new technology. So, um, you know, there's there's different things. I mean, with fabric drops or traditional drops, you know, one of our participants in the chat room already said, you know, you have to have a certain setup in your stage space to be able to make that work. You have to have fly space um, or, you know, I mean, for a lot of high schools or community theater groups, they have to spend a ton of time, you know, uh, painting a, a drop, which some people want to do and teachers sometimes want to give their kids the experience of doing that. But there are a lot of places that don't want to go to the hassle. They would rather focus on other things. So it's a great way to bring professional quality into your show without necessarily having to create your own scenic design from scratch. Or you can create certain elements. You can create, you know, certain flats or certain stage elements. And then, you know, the projection design can really serve as the primary way of transporting your audience into the world. Um, on here, I have it listed as one student can run it. And of course, that applies to schools. But, um, you know, for schools, it's kind of nice to be able to add one more student into the mix who can run the laptop or, or maybe they're even building the slideshow out by dragging different images in there and building in, you know, whether it's blackouts or different cross dissolves, you know, you're bringing one more student into the mix for more professional or semi-professional shows you know, you can um, have a volunteer or somebody that you work with who's, you know, it only takes one more person to really be able to drive that from a technical standpoint. Um, you know, also here, a lot of times directors are wanting to focus on other things. I mean, they always have that list of the things that have to be done when you're producing a show. And uh, a lot of times when I talk to teachers or directors, they'd rather focus their time on the actors. And so 
you know, rather than having to deal with so many technical elements like fabric drops and renting them and then being sent and then being kind of old and musty and having to send them back, you know, they, they can really focus their efforts more on, you know, the, the acting or, or um, the costumes or other elements of the production that they really want to. And then of course you have, you know, um, different animated effects, you know, like rain, snow, fire. We just released through our store, we just were doing a whole series with Snowfall. And, um, you know, we're not just literally doing animated snow, but we're also working in different atmospherics and effects, things that will really bring a very cool, like color or mood or atmosphere to the scene. Um, so artistically, you can bring in all of these elements that you weren't able to before. Um, jump in here anytime too, William, or if there's people who want to write in on the chat, um, you know, I'm kind of blazing through the list here. And that's one thing I want to mention too, is that some of these are, are more fundamental things. And I try to start kind of at that fundamental level. But as you guys are watching or you're listening, please think of or write down or even fire into the chat about things that you specifically want to know that we can drill down into. Because I know some of it can seem kind of basic or kind of simple or, well, I realize that, but I want to make sure and cover those things because for some people it can kind of start to open up their imagination about the ways that they could use projection in their shows. Um, like once again, going back to animation, you know, one of the things you can now do is you can really achieve uh, hard to do effects um, you know, things like punctuating a moment in a show, like for example, Wizard of Oz, if you want the witch to appear on top of a roof in a, in a blast of fire and smoke, you know, obviously you'd have to incorporate some pretty heavy pyrotechnics to make that work, which can be risky and there can be cost or flying Peter Pan or all of these things that um, you had to have certain, a ter certain technical setup in your space to do, which can be very costly, you can do uh, in a much more affordable way, or at least you have the option to do that in a different way. Um, I don't know, William, what do you think? As you're kind of looking down that list too, are there other things that jump out at you that you want to kind of talk about? Yeah, the one thing is really the affordability of it because I know uh, just a few years ago, it was expensive to buy a projection. And I think right. as, as we get more and more technologically advanced, this is becoming more and more affordable for the average performer to be able to buy a projection. And then it's small enough and portable enough that you can travel with it. So maybe we could just talk about that just for a moment, uh, just about how technology gets better and better and how this is really becoming affordable for anybody to use. Yeah, I mean, uh, like everything technical and in the world of technology, the, the further it goes, the, the more affordable it becomes. So um, for example, we've worked with a number of community theater groups and um, you know, often they're working from uh, very, very small budgets and so, the idea being there as we've worked with them, some of them helping consult them or work with them. One of the things we've been able to do is just purchase a projector off of Amazon. And in one case, we bought one for brand new for six or $700. And it's a short throw projector, which um, for those, some may know about short throw, but short throw, mm -hmm. it just has to do with the lens. And what that does is, you know, you can only have a short throw projector eight feet back from your screen and it's going to produce a 20 foot wide image, which is a big image for not having the projector back that far. And so it was a new short throw projector for, you know, $700, um, which was pretty bright. And for a small venue, they could get away with using it. And that's something like you're saying, William, that three or four years ago, you know, or even a couple of years ago, wasn't as much a possibility. So, you know, some theater groups or schools are opting not to rent because they actually can afford to buy something, knowing that, you know, we can use it not only for every single show that we have and just sort of update the artwork, but we also can use this for other functions. We can use it for other events or things that we're having at the school. So, you know, something that I've seen as an obstacle, you know, a teacher will tell me, well, I'll just go to my principal or a community theater group will go back to their board and they'll say, hey, this is really a, a great investment for us because we buy this thing once and we can have it for everything that we produce over the next four or five years. And like you're saying too, William, you have the mobility of it too. So right. you, know, you can pack that with all of your gear, you, you know what you're going to get. I mean, one of the things about venues is sometimes they can be sort of unpredictable. So having a piece of gear that you know is going to work from show to show is, is nice, um, you know, from a point, point of uh, reliability too. So let's talk about uh, once we think we want to start using projections, uh, what do we need in order to make this happen? 
Well, this is one of my favorite slides because um, it really does outline the simplicity of it. Um, it doesn't matter whether you're just starting out, if you're doing a smaller show, even whether you're working with like an elementary school show um, or a youth production, all the way up to Broadway, there are really only three basic neat things that you need outside of the artwork. I didn't mention the artwork, but um, you just need a projector. Um, you need some sort of a surface to project on, and that could be anything. That could be a white or gray wall. That could be a panel that you've painted. That could be some fabric like a frosted shower curtain for um, rear projection. That could be bed sheets. I mean, you you really can work with a number of different things for your um, for your screen, and, and in, in a lot of cases, you may even want to custom build, you know, multiple screens or, or different things like that. So there's a lot of creativity and things you can use for a screen. And then the technology can be everything from a laptop computer or even in some cases an iPad um, all the way up into some of the, the heavier gear. But a lot of the people that we work with are working with very basic tools. They're working with a you know, MacBook and then they've got a Keynote or they're working with a laptop and they've got PowerPoint and they can make it do everything that they need it to do just by dragging whether they're still slides or whether they're dragging um, movie slides into the computer. Um, with these ba three basic things, you can do uh, a lot of things. You can do most things that you're wanting to do with just a few pieces of, um, of technology. So let's first off talk about projectors and what type of projector uh, someone would be wanting to buy in order to get started. Yeah, and this is a good time for my disclaimer too, which is I'm not an AV specialist. Um, I, like you mentioned, I'm the artist, so I work uh, primarily on the art artistic end of things, although I've got a lot of experience just kind of in the trenches working on different shows, um, kind of ranging from smaller shows to bigger shows. But I've talked to a lot of technical directors, people who are um, at the very, very highest levels of doing this. Um, and, and the consensus as I talk to more and more people and really get it is that you know, there's a lot of options out there. It's easy to kind of drown in the options of projectors. And there's, of course, a lot of different specs that you're going to see when you go to shop for a projector or even when you go to rent one. But the, but the one um, universal thing that I've heard is you just want to buy the brightest projector that you can afford, or you just want to rent or borrow the brightest projector that you can. If you think about it in terms of lighting, you know, your projector is going to be balancing with any existing stage lighting or other lighting that you've got going on. So you want something that's bright enough to contend with that. Now, there's some things that you can do on your lighting end to either, you know, uh, tilt it in a different direction or shutter some of the light with barn doors or different things like that. But you still want the brightest projector that you can have because that's going to help the image not to wash out. Um, you know, you want to keep your light off of your screen or your surface as much as possible. In fact, one of the things that we recommend is keeping, if you can keep the, the existing stage light um, off of the screen about five feet. Um, you just wanna create the darkest well that you can close to your screen or surface, um, which is a lot of why a lot of people are even considering rear projection now because that's a good way to keep some of that existing theater lighting off the screen. But once again, going back, as bright as you can afford, um, you know, in fact, to be very specific there, if you're dealing with a smaller space, um, you know, brightness in, in the projector world, they're called, it's called lumens. And so, so in the smaller spaces, you can get away with 2,500 to 3,500 lumens if you do a good job of kind of shielding off some of your ambient lighting. Um, if you're moving into your mid-size venues or even your larger performance venues, you're gonna want you're gonna want to go with a bare minimum of five thousand lumens. Um, but what like would you be the saying, cost for for those like for a yeah, five hundred. That's versus great. Like you're you're, 5, you're right ahead of me. You're, that's perfect. You know. So um, so like I said, on the on the lower end, you're probably talking about something that's in that six to eight hundred dollar range. Um, as you get up into that five thousand lumen count, now you're starting to get up into around the twelve hundred dollar and above range. And you, that goes all the way up to, I mean, there are 100K projectors. I mean, you can you can buy something as bright as you want. But for most people, um, whether it's a mobile show, if it's a high school show, um, they're probably going to want to be in that five to 10,000 mm -hmm. lumen range. So you're looking at around $1,000 to get a good quality projector then? Yeah, to buy it new. Now, you can look at renting too. Um, and a lot of our clients will look at that. But one thing I found with rentals, you want to kind of be careful. You want to make sure they're not charging you in a week what it would cost to almost outfit, outfit yourself with a nice new projector. That makes sense. Yeah. So once you have a projector, just let's talk about the different types of 
uh, ways you can use that to project on the screens? Yeah. Um, the two basic ways, um, and I'll get into here in a little bit, there's some different creative things that you can do outside of just projecting on your stage. Um, and, and a lot of people are experimenting with cool things. But um, but most people are still doing, I would say about 70% of uh, venues are still doing front projection. They're at least they're either using an existing projector that's already mounted in the space. Uh, in some cases, like if it's a high school, um, or a com community center, they might have a computer or a um, projector already mounted up high. And sometimes those projectors are built to project onto a screen that drops down. But a lot of times what they'll do is they'll they'll raise that screen up and just let the projection shine all the way through it, you know, to a back psych or something like that. The main thing there is you just want to make sure that the projector is bright enough that if you're using stage lighting, that it can it can project through that lighting and be bright enough that you're not um, it's not you know, getting diluted down too much. Um, the key here, and as you look at the diagram, the key here, you know, if you are purchasing your own projector, you know, the, the question that I get the most is how do I keep that projection image out of the way of the actors so that the image is not projecting on the actors um, or that I'm not getting shadows on the screen? And the key there is just mounting it up high enough um, sometimes I've seen it mounted to like a light bar, if there's a way to hang it from the ceiling. Um, you know, obviously technical people can really help you problem solve through this and find a good way to get the projector up high enough that it's not going to um, compete with what's happening downstage. And then some of it's always going to be staging too. You, you have to think about how you stage, you know, can you, can you move your actors downstage a little bit? What can you kind of do to kind of work with what you've got? And that's the funny thing is that I get lots and lots of inquiries into how do I make it work in my individual space because every space is different. And you can always consult with um, either volunteers or technical people who are, who are in your network or around you or you know your companies like Epson, Panasonic, a lot of times if you contact your regional um, person or a school, for example, is going to have an AV outfit that they work with already, you, know, you can talk to those folks and they'll sometimes even come out to your site, look at your space and be able to give you a recommendation. Because it's not just the projector, some of it is the lenses too. And a lot of times when you're buying new, you want to think about a projector where you can interchange lenses because that might give you some other options as well. You don't just want to have something um, too fixed, you know, um, even if you're just getting started. Now, would I be safe to saying that you you would want it to be kind of as close to the screen as possible, just so you get the full brightness of your projector? Or does distance from the from the actual screen itself matter? Yeah, yeah, that, I mean, that's true. You, you want it to be as close to the surface as you can. One of the things that can help with that is some of the lensing that I talked about. Like if you have a short throw projector, that projector is not going to have to be as far back from the screen to yield a large image. I will say this, though, I have seen it work before where the projector is pretty far back. Now, the further it goes back and the, the larger the size of the um, image or surface you're trying to cover, the more lumens you're going to have to have. So the brighter it's going to have to be. But um, here in a little bit, I'm going to show some images and, and some um, that were done in, uh, in high school settings even. And you'll see from the photos, they haven't been color corrected or manipulated at all. You'll see, you can sometimes still get a pretty bright image even when your projector has to be either back in the booth. But in general, you do, you want your projector to be as close as you can get it to the screen without getting in the way of the actors. So let's talk about rear projections now. Mm -hmm. A lot of places are considering rear projection, especially as lensing gets better. Um, you know, there are short throw projectors, which I already mentioned. There's also ultra short throw projectors. Now these projectors can still be a little costly. Um, you know, especially if you get up into the higher lumen counts, but, um, but they're accessible. You can buy them. We have one that we purchased here that we take around with us and, uh, and I can actually provide the link to for that. But, uh, we bought that, like I said, brand new, um, on Amazon for, I think six or 700 bucks and, um, it works pretty darn well. And, um, so for rear projection, what you do is if you can imagine this, this is kind of a side diagram, but you have your projector literally sitting at the very the very back wall, and then you float your screen or your projection surface forward. And your screen in this case needs to have, just like a typical psych, I mean, it needs to have enough transparency to it that an image can come through. If you wanna think about the consistency, it's probably close to that of like a frosted shower curtain. And I actually have heard stories where people have literally done that before. They've, they've purchased 
frosted shower curtains from Walmart or Target and stitch them together. Maybe not the exact ideal way to go about it, but a lot of people find creative ways to make it work if they're not going to buy particular materials for it. But um, the projectors can sit on the floor. Like the one that we have, it sits on the floor and it actually projects the image up which is really nice because, you know, then you can put a step ladder, like we've had some places that have put like a step ladder over the projector just to protect it. And if you have to usher, you know, people backstage back and forth, they can, you know, be back there and step over the projector without kind of getting in the way of, um, of the projection image as it's coming forward. And I guess the benefit of this is that the actors aren't going to ever be in the way of that projector. Right. Right. And, and the compromise is that you're giving up some stage space. So if you, if you have some stage space that you can work with, you know, or you, you know, you can, you know, either uh, convince your director or producer to give up a little bit of that space to kind of create the overall effect, you know, like you're saying, William, you don't have to then worry about getting it up high. You can, you know, have that full well back there. And plus the projection image itself, because it can be closer to the screen, you know, it's going to yield a brighter image. So um, how much room do you need back there in order for that short throw to work? Yeah. So um, I think I may, may have referred to it earlier, but the one that we have, and it's a, it's a short throw lens, not an ultra short throw, which ultra short throw would be, you could get it even closer to the screen. But ours is, if you have it about eight to nine feet back from the screen, you get a 20 foot wide by 12 foot tall image, which for a lot of smaller stages, that's a pretty big image that you can get. So let's just talk about some creative ideas that you have with your projection backdrops and kind of the cool things that you can start doing with them uh, once you figure out you know, the projector you're gonna buy, how you're gonna be projecting that image and where your screen's going to be there on stage. Uh, what are some creative tips uh, that you have for when you're starting to use projection backdrops? Yeah, and the reason why I like talking about creative tips is that so often when it comes to projection, our mind goes right to the technical, which is, well, how do I achieve this? What projector do I buy? And all that stuff is super important, but there's a lot of things you can do creatively to just think about how you're telling your story. In fact, I would start there. What story am I trying to tell? And what do I need to tell that story as well as possible? Because if you wait for the actual, for the perfect opportune time to have all of your technical ducks in a row, a lot of times you'll never get started because it just can seem so intimidating or you can you know, be ruled out by cost. In fact, one thing I'll say before I even dive into the creative thing is if you ever go to a conference or you ever go to a seminar where they're saying you need you know, X sum of money, which sounds like a whole lot, or you have to have this or this or this, you know, and, it, and you walk out of there feeling intimidated or like you can't start or it's too technical, I would say you're not talking to the right people because the people who are storytelling minded, even technical directors are going to help you find a way to tell your story on stage. And you can start at a certain level and you can always level up. Um, so when it comes to the creative tips, you know, one of the things that I like to give as an example, I was working with a local group when we were doing Charlotte's Web and they wanted to do some really cool things with the web and how the words appear and have Charlotte actually interact with the screen as the words were, words were appearing on the screen. And so one of the things they did, which I thought was really cool, it's very simple, was that they really thought about the timing of how the projections came on the screen. So kind of like a film and how in film you have an establishing shot before the rest of the shots, before they sort of move in closer on the actors, you know, they would always build in a, build in a black transition and then they would go to the projection first. So the projection would come up first and that was a simple timing thing and the audience would just gush over the projection and then they would ease up their lights. And it's a very simple effect, but it would really give them a great effect, you know, as the scene was starting. So timing is really a big key. And you really can think about how you want to light your show in that way. So, you know, when I was working with a group on Annie, um, you know, there was a scene where she's outside in the street, like in an alley. And um, they really wanted the projection, the moodiness of the projection to, to come forward. So they, they made sure that they, they spotlit her so that in that scene, the projection could really come forward. But then, of course, when there were other scenes, like when she was in the mansion or things like that, they would bring up more traditional lighting and they would let the projection wash back, just like you would do with a traditional fabric backdrop. So a lot of it has to do with how you're telling the story and not so much like this cut and dried, it has to be this way. And so it's good to really think creatively about how you're doing that. Um, in fact, here I reference, you know, expanding your stage canvas. I've seen projections used 
you know, above the stage. I've seen projections used on either side of the stage. Um, I've even seen projections used to paint a three-dimensional environment around the stage. So you're not even dealing with some of that conventional, I've got to balance this with my stage lighting. So you really want to think uh, outside of the bounds of just the stage area when you're trying to paint that world. There might be other ways that you can create an effect. Like down here in Atlanta, we have um, the Fox Theater and uh, we call it kind of like the Broadway of the South. But when you walk in, they're actually projecting clouds onto the ceiling. And before the show ever starts, you feel the spectacle of the theatrical experience just with that simple projection on the ceiling. And those are the kind of ways you wanna start thinking. And as technology grows, it's only gonna get better and better. So we're gonna eventually kind of evolve to a point where some of the technical stuff is going to wash away more and more. And it's really going to be creatively how you use it. Could you have a storm rolling overhead? Could you kind of envelop the audience in this experience? In fact, if you really want to think forward, you know, the things that they're doing, uh, you know, like at the Universal Studios and the things that they're doing like in Disney with more interactive experiences, you're going to see that more and more being done like in, you know, smaller venues or other spaces because the technology is just going to keep getting simpler and easier to use. So that's kind of a way to think about it too. Um, just to reference a couple of other things here, um, some some kind of tricks or workarounds you can do. If you can't afford, um, you know, a big beastly projector, you can double the lumens of your projector by stack, literally stacking projectors together. So if you have two identical projectors, you can put them one right on top of the other. And, you, you know, it takes a little bit of finessing to get the images lined up. But if you have two 2,500 lumen projectors, when those two images come together, you're going to double your brightness. You're now going to have 5,000 lumens. So that's a different way to think about it. Um, you can create your own short throw projector by using a mirror. And a lot of people have experimented with this. In fact, I'd say YouTube is your best friend here because you can hop on YouTube and there's a bunch of DIY methods for doing some of this stuff, but you're literally taking a, a mirror and bouncing the projection image off of it. And then it bounces off the mirror and it doubles the size of the image when it comes back toward the screen, you know, so you can do that if you're rear projecting to give yourself more of a short throw um, you know, projection image. And then, um, just the last couple of things here, and I, I referenced kind of growing it with each show. Don't be afraid to start simple. And the, one of the best things you can do, I mean, obviously you want to research and you want to get a certain amount of gear and, and talking to people is good. There are a lot of people that have tried this in different venues, but also just give yourself time to play with it. There's nothing that's going to be better than your eye as a judge. So a lot of times I recommend to people get a projector, any projector, get an image, any image, go into your space and just play with it. Put the projection up, turn on the existing lighting that you're going to use and figure out like, how am I going to balance it? How am I going to get that light off the screen? How dim do my lights need to be for my projection to really shine the way that I want it to? And that's going to give you real time feedback, which I think is far better than spending endless hours trying to find out every little detail, which end up, may end up working or not working in your space. You don't want to work, wait till tech week or you don't want to wait till the last few days before your show before you try something. And it doesn't have to be an actual projection image or an animation. Just grab any image off of Google and just try it in your space and see if you can get it to look kind of in that area that you want it to look. So before we move on here, Mitch, we had a question in the chat room from Michael. He wants to know what that sick is in your diagram. Oh yeah, psych is cyclorama. Um, that's a short phrase in the theater world for cyclorama. So that's just that curtain that hangs in the back of um, of your stage area for a lot of um, theaters. And, you know, they're used a lot of times in traditional theater. They're used for lighting. You know, they'll just shine traditional lighting off of the off of their psych. It's just kind of a curtain that hangs back there. And a lot of directors or teachers will use that for their projection. Um, and they actually can can look really beautiful. The only thing I'll say about Sykes is you 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 might want to weight it at the bottom if you can, um, because we've actually had instances where there's enough breeze with the air conditioning in a theater that the psych will move. Now you could creatively use that effect if you want to, but you sometimes don't want that effect. So sometimes we've had to put weights at the bottom of the psych um, to get it so that it's not constantly moving, which could could make the audience a little motion sick if there's a projected image on that through the whole show and you don't kind of want that effect. So I'm looking here at the diagram again, and I'm looking at the the psych and then the drop down projector screen. Uh, is there a reason you have both of those in there? Um. 
Yeah, I think in this in this diagram, we just kind of threw it in there. We just kind of wanted to show that, yeah, you can use that you can use that drop down projector screen. That's a, that's a way to use it. And then, of course, we just left the sidewalls because you know I was working with a with a um, a group on the, their production of Shrek, and uh, this lady was thinking very non traditionally, and she decided that she wanted to do some of the effects off stage. So she would have her actors come off stage. And she had a full projection scene set up there where they were doing like this traveling song. So we did like an animated panorama where the background moved behind them. Um, and on Broadway, they have like a little gimmick or effect where they have like a circular set piece that's moving. But she was able to do a full Disney style moving panorama where we actually had three dimensional, almost like cards, like a, like, um, it's kind of hard to explain. I probably could show some examples too, but, um, but it was cool because she could be much more conscious of her lighting and didn't have to worry as much about her stage lighting because she was dealing with a much narrower stage and she didn't even have a way to do that. So the, re the reason why I threw these in here is like, you wouldn't always think of your sidewalls as being projectable you know, spaces, but you can, you can use those too. Now, Terry has a great question here in the chat. He wants to know, how do you make the screen not look like a screen? Do you always have an image on it so it doesn't look like a screen? Good question. <clears throat> so one of the things we would do um, was a couple things. First of all, you know, we would really build out a full slideshow so that even when there's not a projection on there, there is, um, you know, a black slide. And you have to play with it a little bit because sometimes you can very subtly still see, you know, that there's an image there. But one of the ways that we get around that a little bit um, on, our, on our specific slides or on our specific projections is we'll actually vignette them. So we'll create, um, you know, a, a full to black image so that there aren't literally edges on the images. And I'll do that with each show so that it feels like the environment kind of slowly gradates out and that it's not this hard edge. So that's one of, one of the ways that we can kind of get around um, the idea of having something that feels too much like you're just throwing a picture up there. I don't know if that helps. Since we are talking about creative tips, Elter, he says he's curious about the remote controllers that you can use to control the images from your laptop from the stage. So he's probably a one man show and he's wanting to be in full control of that. Gotcha. Uh, do you know if you can use like Apple Keynote or PowerPoint in order uh, to flip through those projections yourself? I think you could. I mean, it's I, I don't deal with a lot of people that do that because a lot of times, you know, they aren't necessarily one man shows. They're, um, you know, they're full theatrical shows where they have a tech booth and they'll have someone who's operating those slides separately, whether they're backstage or out back in the booth and they're just running cable. But um, as long as you have a strong enough signal and you make sure you change the batteries out on those and you've got a, a reliable remote, I wouldn't see why you couldn't use that just like you would in a seminar or a conference. Um, you just would want to make sure you test it so that, you know, you aren't just like um, frustratingly like flipping the, clicking the button and trying to make it work and you're not getting your slides advancing like you want. And he says, will Bluetooth work or does it need to be over Wi-Fi? Oh man, we're starting to get into the technical weeds a little bit. Yeah. I don't know if I can make a specific recommendation there. I think uh, testing, 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 you just want to, um, you know, see what works for you in your specific space. So let's get into some examples uh, that, of things that you've created yourself uh, and just show people kind of the, the different ways to use projections in theaters and in shows. Yeah, this was for a, a community, uh, local community production of Lion King Jr. And one of the reasons I like this slide, first of all, you can really see how vivid and colorful the projections show up. And I think it's pretty amazing how colorful they show up, considering that in this case, the projector was, I think, about 150 feet back. Now, it was a pretty bright projector. I know it was part of the, basically, they had built a new high school. And uh, the projector, you know, was mounted up high. But it was pretty far back. And I was pretty amazed at the effect that they were able to get. Now, the director in this case, there was some of the image that was um, bleeding onto the actors. You can see that there are some of the actors that are there back right towards the screen. She had a very different point of view than I had, which actually was really good for me to see because, you know, being an artist, I'm always obsessed with, you know, keeping the image as clean as possible, as bright as possible, 
trying to keep it off of the actors. In some cases, creatively, and I think this is good for people to hear, she actually liked that the image was hitting the actors in some ways, and she would use that artistically. Like she did a version of uh, Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat, and she had a prison projection that was shining onto the actors. Um, I think at first, sort of my, by mistake, but then she started using that because she loved the look of the texture and the blue lighting that was on the actors. And she would actually use the stage lighting um, on the actors to balance out some of that light too. So it wasn't quite as strong and to deal with some of the edges and stuff. So um, I'm pretty amazed with what, how good some of this stuff does look, even with stuff that's not maybe the best gear. Um, like once again, I want to reiterate my point. It's the best thing you can do is get into your space and just start trying stuff because it's pretty amazing what you're going to find out, what you can do. This was the same show. This was, of course, before they brought the lights up, but this was for Lion King. And we designed, it's so funny, this is one of our most popular projections, um, even though we do stuff that's way more detailed and way more complex. Um, we designed this very simply for the opening song and the sun just sort of subtly rises over the course of the song. And um, I'm just amazed because the audience at first was not aware that the sun was moving, but through the course of the song, they sort of noticed that. And because it was such a subtle effect, I think it actually impacted them more than in something that would maybe have felt more video-like or felt more like a movie. And I think that's something to keep in mind as you're designing um, your show and you're thinking about how you want to tell the story is not to overdo it. You don't want it to look like a movie behind the actors. In fact, if the projections are too dynamic, it's going to start to take away from what's happening on stage. And so you really want to carefully balance your projection design uh, in with your show. You want it to be a subtle effect. If I, if I have things like clouds moving or snow or other effects, I try to use them very artfully and very carefully so that it's not upstaging what's happening with the actors. You really want to be mindful of where the audience is looking um, while at the same time helping to sort of immerse them into the world of the story. Now, do you happen to know by chance what type of material they're using as that backdrop? Yeah, this is a psych. So this is a cyclorama. Is that what you're asking, William? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So this is, this is a good example. I mean, this is just a psych. And uh, I think in this case, this was one of the examples where they had a mounted projector that was supposed to hit a screen, but they just lifted the screen up. And uh, this director says this happens a lot in the different venues. She said, I lift the screen up and the image from the projector actually almost perfectly fills that back psych or that back space, which is kind of cool. It's kind of one of those happy accidents that she discovered that she then took with her from show to show after that. And that's probably because whenever they center that, that uh, slide that drops down, that's probably centered on stage. So when they lift it, it just, everything's perfectly centered. So that's a good coincidence. Yeah, it's perfectly centered. And then there's enough stage depth that it just, it, it, you know, it accounts for making the image large enough that then right. it, um, you know, projects to the back. And that's another thing too, is that, you know, we live in a time that where we're very obsessed with things being really sharp and really HD, which the images that we produce at Theater Avenue, they are all high definition. But the thing you want to remember is that your audience is sitting fairly far back, even the front row. So you don't have to obsess over that too much. That's why one of the specs on projectors, I don't get too worried about people who are not using that full 1920 by 1080 HD frame, because really it's more of an impression that you're trying to create behind the actors anyways. You don't want something that's too sharp. It's kind of like photographic depth of field. If you ever see pictures where the person up front front is super sharp and then you have you know sort of a blurry background it can create that kind of effect and you might kind of want a little bit of that sort of gauzy and feel to the image so that it's not feeling like it's competing once again with what's happening mm -hmm. on stage so here's another great example of charlotte's web and i think what's really cool about this is that some pig was actually animated uh in this projection can you talk about that yeah i mean to, honestly, William, this is one of the things that I love most about projections is there's so much room to play. In fact, it, you know, when I started doing projection design, I come, came from a more film background. And so I, I would think about things pretty literally, almost as if they were seen in a film. 
And, uh, you know, the director I was working with on this show, she was, she was thinking much more theatrically. So I was thinking of putting a web up in the corner of the barn, like quite literally. And she said, no, we're going to splash that web across the entire stage. And so we were thinking much more abstractly, much more like a scenic, much more like a scenic designer would think. And, uh, and so then what happened was we would have the Charlotte, you know, actually interact with the screen. So she was singing a song because it was a musical as she was weaving the web and we slowly animated the web, you know, and the words scrawling across the web as she was singing. And we timed it specifically to go along with that song. And I'm telling you, it was amazing. Every single show, the audience did not expect that. Charlotte's Web is actually one of those shows that's pretty hard to do practically. I mean, there's some pretty cool practical effects that that um, different theaters are doing. When we when we did this, it was amazing because you're able to go from a daytime barn to a nighttime barn, and then we're able to illuminate it as the web scrolls across and then bring it back to daytime. This was one of those shows that really benefited from that day to night to day transition that you get between the scenes. So we had a lot of room to play with this one, and it was really one of those fun ones where we thought, how can the animation not just um, you know be an effect, but how can it really kind of punctuate some of the story points that the director is making in the show? Yeah, this was a piece that we did for Little Mermaid. <clears throat> and I, I should have put the um, the actual video one in there because all of that water and the light rays move behind the castle that we designed. But <clears throat> one of the things that we're constantly playing with is the, the amount of stylization, you know, that we do in our artwork. In fact, um, we have a pretty wide range. We'll do everything from stuff that's completely photorealistic. Um, I mentioned Annie before. And so we'll do stuff that feels like an old um, an old photo that has sort of that vintage look to the photography, um, you know, for backgrounds. And then we'll go all the way to stuff that's being done for maybe like a honk junior that's very cartoonish or Charlotte's Web might be an example too. And then we do everything in between. So stuff that's stylized for, for Shrek, something that's kind of in the middle. Um, and so we're constantly playing with how real, um, how not real. And I think once again, that's what I love about scenic design is that it gives you the opportunity to really play um, in a lot of different areas. If you've seen shows like Wicked or other shows, they I mean, they have a very abstract sensibility to the way that they approach things. And you can, you can really use any style and projection design that you can imagine. Oh yeah, here's an example from Annie. So you, so this is literally, um, you know, something that we, we created with a lot of texture and grit. And um, I was compositing different elements in, different textures, different photographic pieces, um, hand painted pieces. And then, you know, all of it started out black and white. And then I was able, just like you would with an old photo to go in and in Photoshop, just start to tint things to give them a little bit of that old vintage look, which is um, something that I love doing. You can also see some of the vignetting on the sides, which kind of helps it transition from the black that's off the screen kind of into the projection itself. Yeah, just more examples. Of course, you know, the fire can move. Um, you know, you can get really stylized. We do some stuff that feels pretty Tim Burton-esque. You know, that that actually, that slide that William just had up was, um, you know, we did that for Alice in Wonderland. We actually did the Cheshire Cat sitting up on that branch. Um, and we can kind of work in a range of digital styles. One of the things that I really like about this is th all the different styles that you can do. You can do something that's more uh, realistic to something that's completely like more cartoony. And I think that depending on what kind of story you want to tell, that's kind of going to determine whether or not you want something that's more cartoony or something that you want uh, to be more real and to drop you in like a location. And so I think these are just all great examples of just all the really cool things that you can do uh, with projections that I think would be difficult to maybe do with more traditional backdrops. Yeah, and I want to say something about that too. One another director that I worked with, you know, she she would tell me this story about when she was in high school working on um, they were literally painting a backdrop and she said we we clocked 37 hours painting that one drop and she said it was up for one 3 minute song. And so if you think about the time and the effort that went into that, um, some directors or teachers really do want to give their kids or they want to give someone the experience of making something, which is fine. But like I said, there's a whole lot of other directors who are like, if I could bypass that and have something that's much more beautiful and professional and realistic up there, and then really focus on other aspects of the show, I would go that way every time. 
So a lot of the people we were talking to, that's what they're interested in. They're interested in um, creating something really fresh and new. And I'm going to say, even in this photo right here with uh, Charlotte's Web, I think that looks, I mean, it looks like a real photo, a real place. And then the, even though the webbing looks great. And so, you know, if you were to tell me that that was a projection, even I might not even believe you, you know, the first the first time you told me that just because of how great this this looks. Yeah. And I have to tell you a story about this one, too. The way they did the screen for this is amazing. They had a construction minded dad because they were a small enough outfit he built a frame out of wood from Home Depot. So he literally built a screen for under $100. He got a hold of this roll of construction plastic and he built a, he found a way to do a bicycle ratcheting system where he actually could pull the construction plastic taut around the frame, just like you would a painting. And that made this beautiful frosted screen. So that way, like you're saying, what you're looking at, I mean, you could not tell the difference. It was amazing. And the reason why I want to mention that is because, you know, whether you're looking online or you consult with somebody who's in your network who has a little bit of that construction mind, you can use things like PVC piping, you can use wood, you can fashion your own screen, which you can then break down after your show. You know, if you're a, a venue where you can store some stuff, you can build it so you can break it back down, store it, put it back up for your next show, and you've already got something that you can use. Now we're gonna open this up for questions if you're in our live audience right now. So if you have a question for Mitch, uh, please let us know in the chat. Uh, for now though, while we're waiting for those questions to come in, Mitch, how do we learn more about Theater Avenue? How do we find more information about you? And if we're interested in seeing what projections you have available, how do we find those? Yeah, um, the best way is just to check out our website, which is theaterav.com. And I'll spell that out. Actually, we can put it in the chat too, but that's the old spelling of theater, T-H-E-A-T-R-E, -E, av, just A-V-E, like avenue. So theaterav.com. And, okay, and we'll uh, put a link, if you're watching this on YouTube right now, we'll put a link in the show notes uh, for Theater Avenue, uh, sorry, for theaterav.com. And you can go there and you can see all of those projections uh, that Mitch has created, all of them himself. I think that's very, very impressive. And if you're watching this right now and it's not live, you can find out more about when we're holding these well-attended workshops uh, by just going to wellattended.com forward slash workshops. And we'll have a long list of a lot of our podcast guests that have been on previous episodes. They're going to come back and they're going to be doing these live workshops with us. So Mitch, I just want to say before we get to these questions, thank you again for uh, joining us today. I know I've learned a lot in this uh, in this first workshop that we've been doing. We do have some questions coming in here. Uh, John asks, can you discuss your custom packages? What are those? Yeah. Yeah, and we actually do have a page on our website too. If you want to check it out, it's it's custom design on our website. But um, basically, the, the only thing I'll say about it is that I love working on custom design because it gives me a chance to work directly one-on-one -on -one with somebody, um, really realizing their vision for their specific show. Our custom work does start at $4.99. So, um, but then we, you know, we'll talk to you, consult with you, talk to you about your show, talk to you about your story. Um, talk to you about the mood and atmosphere, and then we're kind of working hand in hand to develop um, an overall look for your show. And um, a lot of times then, uh, those are slides that we can then use again in our store. And so that sometimes allows me to, to, to discount the work too when I'm working with people, the fact that um, it's not just one time. Now, if I do work with you on a custom project, you hold permanent display rights to that. So everything that we create for that, you would be able to use for all shows. And actually, I do want to say that about all the stuff that I produce anyways. Um, when, you pr when you purchase something, if it's one of our existing pieces on Theater Ave, we don't do rentals. So if you purchase like that Rising Sun, then that's yours to use. You can use it for that show. You can use it for another show. Um, we have stuff that's very specific to shows, but then we also have stuff that's a little bit more generic. Like I was saying, we, um, we, we're doing a whole snowfall series. So if you want snow in your show, um, you could use that then for any show where you want to kind of add that effect to your show. Now in those custom packages, uh, does that include a certain amount of backdrops or how does that work, that process? Yeah, in fact, that's that's a great question because I, I work with you specifically to kind of figure out um, 
what you need, the number of scenes that you need, how complex the scenes are, because uh, you know no two projections are made alike. Some of them we can create the effect that you're going for with some pretty minimal effects or even just simple graphic shapes. Maybe you're going for more of a mood and it's kind of almost like a fancier light than it is um, a fully rendered scene. If we get into work where we're literally digitally painting an entire scene. Um, some of that work can get kind of labor intensive, but, um, but that's why I really consult with people and work with them because sometimes um, less is more. Sometimes you can actually get a greater effect by having, um, by painting more of a mood or an atmosphere back there and not getting into all the detail. So it really depends on the show. And some of it too, like we were talking about before is consulting about the type of style that you want because you might want something that's slightly more car cartoonish and that has a certain, you know, uh, process that's that's attached to it. Or you might want to do something that's a little bit more photorealistic. The nice thing about digital that I'll say is that once you create an image, um, the amount of time that I can that I need to create that image as a nighttime scene, or as a snowy scene, or as a scene with rain, um, you know, once the scene is created, you know, that of course like can bring down the cost and the amount of time. Um, that we're needing to create that like from there. So like I was saying with that that version of Swan Lake that we did, you know, I, I took the effort up front to, it you know, probably took me 20, 25 hours to paint, you know, a scene digitally, but then I used all kinds of uh, coloring, like even aggressive reds and purples and, and did some where the moon was brighter and did some where it was more of a nighttime blue with stars in the sky. And I was able to do different variations from that once the scene was created a lot easier than if we were painting each individual one from scratch. And Terry has, a, I think, a great question. For custom work, do you need to know if it's front or rear projected? Um, it, in some ways, it doesn't matter. Um, you know, any image that we create can be front or rear projected. Um, you know, of course, if there's a certain direction or, or side that you want a certain element on, like if you've got a stump and you want it on the right side, you may have to flip that image, you know, to make it work for one or the other, depending on which direction it's coming from. But I do get that question a lot, which is, you know, does it matter? And the, the reality is you can use any image for front or rear projection um, interchangeably. So that, that, that shouldn't affect, um, you know, just the way you're displaying it shouldn't affect the image itself. So we've got time for a few more questions here. Uh, Michael asks, should a cyclorama be a slightly transparent material like you mentioned in the beginning for rear projections? Yes, you want it to be, it has to have a little bit of transparency. So it can't be um, totally opaque or of course it's not gonna catch the image. The, the image is gonna get blocked. Um, on the on the flip side of that, you also don't want it to be too transparent. So I get questions sometimes about using a scrim and some people do project on the scrims. There's no hard and fast rules whether or not you can, but a scrim, just to let you guys know, is, is, is quite a bit thinner. It's almost like, um, it's almost like a very fine netting. Um, which is used in theater. And sometimes that can be too transparent. You'll actually see the light of the projector if you're rear projecting that will come and project through. And you don't want that. So you do want something that's kind of in the middle there. Now, one thing I'll say when it comes to materials, if you're not just doing something that you're building there at home or that you're kind of um, fashioning in a DIY way, you can really consult with like a Roscoe. There's a, there are different companies like that. And I could, we could put up some of the websites too or make those available because um, a Roscoe, for example, you know, they'll consult with everybody who's Broadway on down to your smaller venues. Like a lot of times they'll work with high school or middle school teachers to find a fabric or find a material that's perfect for either a site that you want or even as something specific to projection because there's materials that, that are made that are specific to projection. So if you're looking to rear project and you wanna level up, they can help you find a material that is grabs the image even better. The reason why I mention all those other things is because I don't want people to feel like I have to have that premium material to be able to start projecting. You actually, you actually don't need that. So Terry has a question here. Are the moving elements like fire, is that actually a video that's playing? Yeah, and, and that, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, it, is, it is a video. The finished file is a video. And the way that I'm producing those is I'm literally compositing, or compositing is just a fancy way of saying just it's almost like collaging bits and pieces into the, into the final image. A lot of times you'll see this in, in visual effects in film where 
Like if, for example, if it's a torch, you know, you may paint the entire scene like a matte painting or like a scene, and then we'll either film or we'll find a piece of video that we can find and we actually will shrink that down and, and composite that or collage it into the video. And of course, from there, you know, if you're kind of drilling down artistically, you know, there's a lot of things to think about, about making it feel like it's not just stuck into the scene, but making it feel like it gels in with the scene that all the colors match, that everything kind of meshes together so it doesn't feel like it's just sort of being thrown in there. But yes, um, and we'll use Photoshop um, for some of the painting, but then I use a program called After Effects, which is kind of like Photoshop on steroids. It's just Photoshop with all the layers that can do video, and you can incorporate a lot of different video elements and effects into the, into the scene with programs like that. After Effects is not the only one, but it's probably the most common one that's used for that. So along those same uh, lines of questions, is this like a GIF that's just gonna be playing over and over and over and over? Or do you have to have some way to have a video uh, repeat itself over and over and over? Or like, how does that work? Yeah, the way that I do them is I build them as loopable files. So if it's a scene, for example, if it's not just one effect in one moment that we need to use, but it needs to play through a scene, because that's a great point. A lot of scenes, you need it to be very variable because one scene may play in five minutes one night, six minutes the next night, seven minutes the next night. You need some flexibility. So what I do is I build... Um, I build them as QuickTime files and I render them out and compress them down, which basically means just shrinking down the file size so that it's not going to bust your computer to play it. Um, but I will build it as a perfect loop. So that way you can just set that particular um, slide in your PowerPoint or in your keynote presentation to repeat. And when it repeats, you're not gonna see the seam, it will be seamless. It will just continue to play. And I make sure the video file length is long enough that the audience is not gonna catch the, catch it too. So, you know, there are certain things I'll leave out, like a flock of birds maybe flying up. I might leave that out of a shorter scene so that they're not seeing that flock of birds every two or three minutes, if that makes sense. I'm keeping the effects subtle enough that you don't, you don't ever see the seam, you know, as you're, as you're watching that. Mitch, I want to thank you so much for answering some of these questions today. If people are at home or watching a replay of this, what's the best way for them to get in contact with you uh, to at, get those questions that they have answered? You know, you can hop on theaterav.com and we have a contact form. You can write to me um, just to say hello. You can write to me about your project. You can ask more questions. We have a contact form on there. Um, you also can just email me. We are in the process of spinning off from a larger company called Freedom House Productions. But right now, my email is Mitch at freedomhouseproductions.com. So feel free to email me if you want to get in touch with me directly um, or just hop on online and fill out a contact form. Um, there's a place there where you can tell us all about your project and what you're hoping to do. And um, I love to do phone consultations. So I'll give you a ring and we can talk through your project and, and see what your needs are. And if you are watching this online right now, uh, we'll put a link in the notes section at the bottom of this video uh, so you can access all of those slides that we talked about today. If you want to go back and kind of read through some of those, I uh, just click on the show notes in the bottom of this episode. Mitch, I want to say thank you so much for joining us today. I love it. I could do this all day, every day. Well, hopefully you'll be, uh, be happy to come back then at another, for another workshop at another time. Absolutely. Anytime. So thank you guys so much for joining us. Uh, like I said, I'm William Rader. I'm the founder of Well Attended. If you want to learn more about our upcoming workshops, you can go to wellattended.com forward slash workshops, or just go to wellattended.com and click the workshop link at the top of the page. And you can see all of those upcoming workshops that we're going to be having uh, in the near future. Also, we would love to work with you to manage, help you manage your box office. Uh, you can go to wellattended.com and click sign up to create a free account to see how we're working with lots of theaters, artists, individual performers to help them manage and sell more tickets to their shows. So I'm William Rader. Thanks again, Mitch Stark, for joining us today. Yeah. See you, everybody. Thank you so much.